Hello, can we? It is uh, one o'clock. Can we get started? All right. I, I thought we had ten people. Okay, good. You can all come here so that uh, we'll have some conversation. You don't want to get close enough to spread the virus. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay spread yourself. <laughs> Keep far away from the viruses, yeah? Okay, all right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to Alan Siho. You don't, he doesn't need introduction. He's a good friend. He's a professor at the University of Hong Kong. He has his own practice now in Hong Kong. He's a leading thoracic surgeon who practices minimally invasive thoracic surgery. So. I'm going to let uh, Alan take his topic on. Okay, thanks so much. Um, so they asked me to talk about that cymectomy. Very boring topic. This is probably going to be the most boring 20 minutes of the entire meeting for you because I'm not going to show you anything different. Now, the thing about thymectomy is, is that there's so many different ways of doing it. And over the years, I've done everything from conventional vats, needoscopic vats. I've done the single port. I've tried it subxiphoid. I've even tried in early days uh, robotic. So at the end of the day, I think I've, I've just settled back on just a very standard three-port technique. And sometimes the the, the easiest thing is sometimes the best. So I'm just going to take you through a very simple case. This case was not selected. This was just a case I did my last case a couple of weeks ago. So it wasn't even one of my best operations. You'll see this video is actually quite poor. Actually, I did it quite badly. But uh, nonetheless, it's real life. So I'll just take you through how I do it nowadays, a very standard three-port VATS technique. Now, if, if anything in operation, well, we always start, of course, with anesthesia. And I do have to admit that uh, when I was working in Shenzhen over the last uh, three, four years, uh, we did a lot of our cases, uh, especially the mycenia cases with non-intubated vats. So the, the good thing about that is, of course, myasthenic patients, you don't need to use any muscle relaxants. And in theory, that decreases the chances of uh, crisis and myasthenic complications postoperatively. It's feasible, it's possible, we didn't get into any trouble with it, but uh, on the other hand, we didn't see too much advantage with it. So it's just there, just to, uh, as I mentioned. Now, after you anesthetize a patient, of course, is positioning. And the, you've probably seen all these diagrams many times. This is the standard sort of positioning. I think most of us here in this room, we would prefer the patient sort of just slightly tilted up, um, the shoulders slightly tilted up. And this is how I used to do it. This is a very standard kind of a picture that you see around the world. You hang the arm across the top. Now. I used to do this, but I started to go away from this because I've, I've found that uh, it's not so comfortable for me because I'm working sort of flat across the patient. It's not tilted enough. And I think uh, nowadays uh, what, what I tend to do is I tilt the patient even more. It's almost a full lateral position. You don't want it completely full lateral because if it's full lateral, I mean a lot of the uh, thoracic contents will flop forward, obscure your view of the uh, thymus. So I, I tend to put it in a lateral position, just lean them back slightly. It doesn't matter what you do with this upper arm as long as it exposes the axilla where you want to put your ports, and that's how I do it. I do gently flex the table if I can, and again, that's just to uh, maximize the intercostal spaces for instrumentation. And then we put in our ports. Now, this is uh, from Dr. Agastian's uh, 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 presentation. So this is the very standard sort of port placement technique. I think in this particular picture, Agastian puts in uh, uh, four ports. Uh, I tried of one or two cases. I found that fourth port completely useless, so I don't, I don't do it anymore. I only use three ports. And in generally, uh, most textbooks around the world will show you putting it in this sort of, kind of a crescent formation around the, uh, the breast. Uh, for a female patient, of course, this goes under the mammary fold, so that becomes quite cosmetically appealing. But again, I vary from this a little bit especially these lower ports. This lower port here, sort of under the nipple anterior port, I find practically useless because you put in a port from this sort of angle to actually reach the upper parts of the thymus. There's a lot of levering between the wounds. So this is uh, how I end up nowadays, whoops, sorry. This is how I ended up with my, my ports nowadays. So I use a three-port technique. Now I always start off with a camera port, sort of, and the, my usual landmark is just the tip of the scapula. You just go slightly forward, slightly below the tip of the scapula. You don't want it too far back, otherwise you're kind of reaching over the lung to visualize the anterior mediastinum. So a little bit further forward from the scapula. 
camera port goes in, and then you can place your other two ports. The left-hand port, uh, I just put in Nexilla. It's not too important. Again, you don't want it too far forward, so otherwise you're kind of levering too much to reach the uh, retrosternal space. So it's a little bit further back. And this third port here, that's my right-hand port. And you'll notice here that I don't use any trocar for that. Uh, these two ports, I usually use three millimeters or five millimeters. This port here, I use uh, sort of about eight millimeters. And just wide enough so I can get a large variety of instruments through there. You do need the support anyway to extract the specimen, so you don't need to keep it too small. Um, you notice here that I actually, although these are uh, ports that are capable of taking CO2, I don't actually use CO2 nowadays. Uh, in theory, it gives you a bit of advantage, less blood, it separates the tissues, etc., etc. But in actual fact, I don't think it actually makes too much difference. So that's how I do it. And uh, so three ports. The first camera port is just a five millimeter, 30 degree scope in this particular video. In the left hand port, I use a five millimeter grasper and you'll see throughout the entire operation that doesn't change. I just keep that instrument there. Everything is done through the right hand port. I use no trocar. This is quite important because most of your pain and paresthesia after surgery comes from the trocar, not from your surgery. And uh, through that uh, right-hand port, you'll see in the video that almost all the time I just use one harmonic scalpel. That's all I use. And sometimes, uh, if necessary, I put in a set of my uniportal dissectors. These are the instruments I use for my uniportal lobectomy. And because I use a slightly wider, you know, eight millimeter port, I can fit these instruments very nicely through that right-hand port. And sometimes that just gives you a little bit more uh, versatility through the port. As I said, I don't routinely use CO2 nowadays. Uh, I, I, I know some people do, but I think that the, uh, the, the benefit is outweighed by the clumsiness of extra instrumentations and the airtight port, and I can't use this wider port here in my right hand. So again, this is from a standard textbook. This is the usual schematic of how to do it. And this is from Rene Peterson, and he, we do more or less the same thing. So you, we use a right side uh, VATS approach, because if you're standing on the right side of the patient, it's just more ergonomic. Your hand goes from right to left, from uh, from the feet towards the head, and it's just more uh, smoother to do. And if you do a right side approach, you'll usually start at the right inferior horn, find where the phrenic is, and dissect everything from right to left across your screen. You reach up into the superior horn, and as you uh, secure the right side, you gradually expose the, uh, the uh, feeding veins from the thymus to the innominate vein. And so this is the video. So this particular patient was a young man recently diagnosed uh, myasthenia gravis. He didn't have a very large thymus. In fact, it was a very small thymus with not, no thymoma. With the thymoma, I probably wouldn't grasp the thymus so much. But you'll see in this particular video, in this particular case, I grasp the thymus a lot. Probably I shouldn't. So we're starting here, uh, sort of uh, in, in the right uh, inferior horn. There's a little bit of thin fatty tissue, but you, the right inferior horn was relatively underdeveloped in this patient, wasn't very big. So once you remove that corner, I mean, I always find it easier just to give yourself more space. I work under the sternum first. And once you separate the, the thymus from the back of the sternum, actually it opens up the space a bit more and it makes the rest of the operation a little bit easier. So again, we're working from right to left across the screen from the inferior horn towards the uh, superior horn. And so it's all done just literally with a harmonic scalpel. So you save a lot of time by just using a blunt dissection and the uh, energy dissection with just one instrument. And if you don't need to change your instruments all the time, you find the operation actually goes a lot smoother, a lot quicker. And again, these, these, this is exactly the same sort of a, you know, hand technique we use uh, with uh, uniportal lobectomy. It's exactly the same sort of trick. Nothing special. So uh, you find there we, we were going behind the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, internal mammary vein just now. We've cleared more or less the right uh, superior horn, and now we're reaching over the top of the pericardium into the left uh, inferior pole. So we're just reaching right over. You can already see the left lung in the background there. there yeah, there it is. So we're just lifting. Yeah, you can see I'm grasping the, the thymus a bit more than I normally do. So kind of rounding the corner of the inferior horn. And you can probably make out uh, further back there, you'll have the fretting nerve back there. And uh, it's actually easy, quite easy to uh, avoid.
And you see all through the operation, basically you don't need to change your instruments at all. It's just a grasper in the left hand, harmonic in the right hand. Very simple. And you can see what I mean. Once you uh, free the thymus from the back of the sternum, there's usually quite a lot of room to work with. You could use CO2 in this kind of situation, but I don't think it adds a whole lot. I think at this stage, you notice actually I, I, I actually went into the left pleura, and I, I don't think it's any big deal to go into the pleura. In fact, if anything, I think, uh, it, again, it gives you a bit more space, especially if you're dealing with thymoma cases. I routinely go into the opposite pleura anyway, just to, to give myself more space. So the left inferior horn is more or less uh, opened up, I'm going back onto the pericardial surface now. Uh, so we're kind of gradually working our way up towards the innominate vein territory, which is always the uh, dangerous spot, of course. The uh, venous drainage into the innominate vein, of course, is very variable. So you do need to take your time with this and go slowly. You never know if there's an unexpected venule coming coming out. You can see the uh, the. Uh, internal mammary vein there, which uh, we avoided. I once had a disaster using a chemonic scalpel when I actually caused bleeding there. So we're always very careful around that vein. Now, as we're going up along the innominate vein, again, usually if you can find the right plane, it's actually quite easy. It's extremely rare to have any significant adhesion in this area. So a bit of a sharp and blunt dissection, as you see here, is usually OK. This area under the manubrium is often the tightest part of all. And this is exactly where you want to look for the small venules. So often this is the trickiest part of the operation. So you need to go slow. Take small bites with the harmonic. Uh, big bites, sometimes you, you inadvertently cause a bit of bleeding. So I, you can see I'm working very, very slowly here. Is taking my time. I don't want to, <laughs> if you have any bleeding here, it's very hard to control. Okay, you can see here I'm using my uniportal VATS instrument here. With that eight millimeter port, you can easily get a double jointed instrument in here for uh, blunt dissection. And here we're just teasing out the left superior horn. This left superior horn in this patient is relatively long. And it's always just passive traction, not too hard and just uh, getting into that capsule. You can see the edge of the capsule there. I think a lot of uh, juniors, when they make a mistake, is that they don't actually see that capsule. They just go in with an in energy instrument. But if you get into the capsule, you can see it's very easy just to gently lift that uh, uh, pole from inside the capsule, and it comes out so easily. I always apply a bit of energy at the top of this capsule. There's always some uh, very small feeding uh, uh, vessels right here. And if you just yank it out, sometimes it's a bit of bleeding. So you just use a bit of energy here. You can see we've more or less cleared this innominate vein. And then, and then we actually see the main uh, thymic vein here. In this particular case, we're lucky it was just one thymic vein. So again, I'm using a uniportal instrument just to get around this uh, venue. Now, at this point, you, you could just use a harmonic directly on that. These venues are so small that you can just use an energy device and they seal up quite nicely. But I thought, what the heck? Uh, just for peace of mind, we'll just put a vascular clip on it. These things are cheap anyway. So I just put two proximally and the distal side I use our energy device. And that's nice and easy. And once that's done, all you're left with is just this little bit of uh, thymic tissue here. Sometimes, of course, this thymic tissue reaches right into the uh, AP window. And in that particular case, you, it, you do need a bit more teasing and dissection. Uh, you can reach around the other side with the 30-degree uh, scope. Uh, I've never really found it absolutely necessary to use uh, left-sided ports just to get the AP window. But uh, I, I do realize some people do that. So that's it. So this turned out to be actually a very small thymus. And uh, put it in the bag, and out it comes. But that's only part of the uh, operation, of course. You'll, you'll notice that uh, I take the pericardial fat separately. So this is just the thymus gland itself proper. And then I always go back and just clear out as much of the pericardial fat as we can. 
So I saw this tissue right from the beginning. I didn't think it actually belonged to the thymus gland, but it was this thin layer of fat here. So we just went back in and just gradually teased out all this fat as much as possible. It was a strange case. There was this odd-looking ectatic vessel coming down. I didn't, didn't know what that was. But you can separate it from that vessel here. You can see the phrenic along its course. And you'll notice I, I, I use the harmonic. I, I found in, in the old days when we used to use uh, electrocautery and diathermy, it uh, occasionally caused a, uh, a phrenic palsy. But using a harmonic energy, actually, you don't get that problem. You can go quite close to this nerve without causing any damage. And so we're just clearing out all this pericardial fat, just as we did with the uh, thymus. And I think, uh, of course, with these uh, myasthenic cases, always important to get as much of that fat out as, as possible. We went back over to the left side. There's a bit more uh, sort of fat, pericardial fat, down here as well. But a thick pad, actually, which was separate from the main thymus gland. And so we went back and we actually cleared, oops, sorry, it went too fast. Yeah, can we go back? Can we go back? Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, so, uh, wait a minute, I think, uh, okay, never mind. Yeah, that, that's more or less, it. forget it. So that was the thymus gland at the end of the day. Uh, so it's just the four poles. We always mark it when we send it off. This is a cosmetic, oops, ah, damn, sorry. I'm having problems controlling this thing. So two, two five millimeter ports, these heal uh, quite well. In a few weeks time, they're next to invisible. Just one small port, we put in a 20 French chest strain. You can use a small one if you want. Sometimes I, I don't use a chest strain at all. In fact, in, in Shenzhen uh, over the last four or five years, we, we tend to do it tubeless with absolutely no chest strain. But I always found it a bit annoying not putting in a chest strain because if there's even a little bit of air inside, sometimes on post-op day one or day two, the x-ray shows a little bit of surgical emphysema, which I find very annoying. So I just leave that in for a few hours over, overnight and I just yank it out. This chest strain, I put a few extra holes in it. That was the end of the video that I didn't manage to show you. But this chest strain goes across on the right, across the anterior mediastinum, and the tip ends up in the left pleura. So just one chest strain draining everything, as you do. So this is what the... Uh, uh, Actually, the, the film looks like, actually, this is not pre-op. This is actually post-op. It's, it's the wrong way around. Yeah, so, uh, so this is how the chest drain goes from one side all the way to the other. And that drain comes out just uh, with less than half a day after the end of the operation. And that's it. This patient went home in uh, about 48 hours and uh, with virtually no pain. And uh, as I said, I only did it two weeks ago. So we're going to have to see how his uh, myasthenia resolves over the next year or so. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, uh, that's the first talk. Do, do you want to discuss it now? Should we leave it till the end? There's not much to discuss. It's a very standard thing. Now, if not, I'd, I'd like to introduce my very good friend and one of the most respected surgeons here in Asia, Dr. Anis Ahmed, uh, very experienced. And he's going to be talking about a very specialized topic, mesothelioma, which I think a lot of us don't have that much experience with. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Alan. So, just a bit there, guys. Okay, right. Now, this is a topic you should go to sleep. Right. It's a bit of a hard topic if you're, you're not familiar with the disease. So, mesothelioma is a disease of the industrialized countries. So, I think uh, where we sit, as in Thailand, you are going to start seeing the iceberg come out of the water and probably you will face this disease more in your clinical practice. So if you look at this map, the ones which are in dark have the highest incidence of mesothelioma. So if you look at where we are, surprisingly, it is quite less. So this is the darker parts where it is quite high, which is North America. 
is excessively high in UK and Netherlands because people there apparently are more susceptible to the disease. And well, there have been as industrialized nations for a longer time. That could be one of the reasons, okay? But is it true? Don't know. So if you look, Australia and New Zealand have the highest incidence by age, and they also have the highest incidence and mortality related to mesothelioma, which is quite interesting because they are not that industrialized when compared to the other parts of Europe or America. Now, interesting, if you look in this graph, you look at Asia where we are. So happily, at least for this disease, we are quite lower down. Okay, so we're not doing too badly, I think, for this disease. Is it true? So this is presented, I think, uh, in one of the government uh, regulatory board meetings in, the, in Singapore. Um, this is the mesothelioma rates by country. As I said, you will find that UK is right at the top. UK, Australia, Netherlands. Is it something to do with the population, genetics, or just the industrialization rates in these countries which is affecting. There has been no results which came out of this. I'll just throw in quickly three papers and then we'll move on to talk about the disease itself. So Thomas Bianchi wrote this paper in 2012 where actually he had a collection of papers from Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, Singapore. In spite of a history of shipbuilding and industrialization quite early in these countries, relative amount of mesothelioma and the patients susceptible to the disease has been much low. At least for once, we seem to be better off than our Western counterparts, yeah? That's right. Now, this is from Korea, decade of malignant mesothelioma surveillance. It, it find, they find that in Korea is much lower than in other countries. And this is from China. Uh, in 2013, I think this data has been kind of remained the same actually over the last five years as well. They, they had 2,040 cases and uh, the malignant mesothelium related deaths were about 1,600. So they had a crude incidence of 1.5 for a million population. Um, which is actually significantly less when compared to our Western counterparts. Okay, so how do we treat mesothelioma and what's our role? So we are surgeons, that's what we are here talking about, a disease which is a slow-growing disease, don't forget that, but it can be quite debilitating as it advances in, uh, in progression. So we'll answer a few questions before the end of my talk, which is what is the use of surgery in pleural mesothelioma? And what are the present limitations which stops us from doing surgery from mesothelioma? And why there is so much controversy about every time we talk about surgery for mesothelioma? I was surprised last time when I was in Thailand when some of the general surgeons said, we don't operate here for mesothelioma, which is true, but is that correct? Are we doing the right thing? And what are the types of operations you can offer for a patient? What are the discussions we should have? And what are the things we should be combining with surgery? First of all, is it curable? Is there a possibility that we can cure mesothelioma in combination with other modalities? I'm not so sure. Why? Because there are limitations to, because of the disease itself. It is, it is the biology of the disease. It's not a localized disease, it's a diffuse disease. It affects the pleura of the chest. So it is a diffuse disease. It's not systemic, but it's a diffuse disease. The staging system is still not refined, okay? Even though IMIG in the recent years has developed a better form of staging, which is a little bit getting much more refined, it's still not good. Most of the disease in our parts of the world, I think, is not diagnosed. That, that may be responsible for the false low incidence of prevalence. So, or even if it is diagnosed, it's too late, these patients are old, they will say, I don't want anything done, okay, which is the common thing. Um, because it is a diffuse disease, the surgical expertise for it is demanding. And because it is demanding, many of us may not be willing to undertake it which is also a part of a problem. 
and also the performance status. The first question if the patient who is 70 comes to your clinic, the son or the daughter is going to ask you, how is my father going to be after such a major surgery? So assessing the performance status of this patient makes a big decision. So how do you decide and how are you going to treat this disease and this patient? I think a few things. Okay, clinical factors, basically age. It's a very tricky question. What do you call old age nowadays? Okay, if you call anybody less than 86 in Singapore, you can get sued. Okay, all right. So nobody's old, right? So what is old? So old is somebody when he walks through the door on his own without anybody's help, bangs on your table and says, "I want surgery." Yeah, he's not old. Okay, that's fine. Sex, I think females have poorer prognosis than males. It's documented, okay? So uh, if there's a female with a mesothelioma, if it's a limited mesothelioma, I will undertake. If it is very diffuse and advanced disease, I will probably go for the palliative option, your decision making. Functional status, as I said, total whites and platelet count. Now, thrombocytosis has shown to have very poor prognosis. So if the patient has got severe thrombocytosis, you may want to consider again. And symptomatic chest wall, which is about one-third of the patients present with this common symptom. So in that, you can tell the patient that the surgery for you is done for the pure reason of relieving pain. So it's basically a palliative operation. So how you approach everywhere and how you decide on the treatment also depends on how they're present. Pathologic factors, yes based on the types of mesothelioma, right? So if it is an epithelioid, you can tell the patient safely that he's got a good outcome. Sarcomatoid, not so good. And biphasic, even worse. So a bulky sarcomatoid and whatever biphasic, I would say, uh, we will see how you respond to your chemo. If you show good response, which they usually don't, then we will offer surgery, otherwise it will be palliative care. So the best ones are the epithelioid, okay? So any form of malignant epithelioid, mesothelioma, you're right in offering surgery. Second is the extent of spread. Now, is there a question of nodal involvement? So there's a lot of papers which says if there is N2 disease, you don't operate. If there is N1 disease, you can go ahead. I think any nodal disease in meso is bad, but there's a lot of confusion about why there is an N2 disease in a mesothelioma because it's a plural disease. And the prognostication with an N2 lymph node strictly doesn't correspond to your survival rates in mesothelioma. So it has to be a tumor board decision after a new adjuvant whether this patient is responding or not before you embark on such a major treatment, especially in node positive patients. Uh, then physiological factors, which I would put it as more clinical, but I also test his lung function, his cardiac status, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. And molecular profiling. Now, molecular profiling is coming very new into the thing, so you have a lot of uh, mesotheliomas which express MET and RET, so they are proto-oncogenes which are being measured right now, and there's a thing called BAP1 testing, which is being used increasingly as a prognostication factor. I'll talk about it in a little while. Okay, how do you overcome these limitations, okay? First is tumor extent. This I learned about two years ago from a very interesting conversation with uh, Professor Wento Fang from uh, Shanghai and Hong Kong. So he said the higher the bulk of tumor, the poorer the prognosis. So this was discussed at, uh, at the IMIG meeting. So they have a CT scan and they have volumetric CT scan. So if you are privileged enough to have a software which can design that, you can ask your radiologist to calculate the amount of volume of tumor for you. So they have very good definitions of what is a poor prognosis. If on a CT scan, if your diaphragmatic thickness in a mesothelioma is greater than four centimeters, the patient has got poor prognosis, not worth doing it. If it is between two and three, is okay. If it is less than one, very good prognosis. Almost no recurrence. Two and three, you must tell the patient there was a high chance of local recurrence. Beyond four, advisable not undertake because they come back within three months. So this is the kind of things you start. It's coming into the thing. It's not there out in what you would call black and white, but it will come out very soon. Next is nodal extent, which I've already talked about, and classifying nodal extent. Metastatic disease. Use PET-CAD scans. 
but I would take that with a pinch of salt. Not all of them are PET positive. So keep an eye on that one. Yeah? So just because they are PET negative doesn't mean anything. All right? And never use PET for prognosticating after giving a new adjuvant therapy. There is no change. Blame me. What are the types of surgery you can offer? I think there are. So you use a diagnostic VATS. That's for diagnosis. Okay? You need proper tissue. You need proven thing. So there are two schools of thought. When you do a diagnostic VATS, if you think it's a mesothelioma by experience, you can put talc and convert, make a talc pleurodesis so that the lung freezes. So you can do an EPP if you are an EPP practicing surgeon. If not, if you think at a later date you're going to come back and do a proper PD, which is pleurectomy decortication, just take a biopsy and get out. Drain the effusion. You'll be good. Okay. So I have two options which I work with usually. I belong to this category, pleurect pleurectomy and decortication. I stopped doing my last EPP was seven years ago. Okay. I stopped because I had a mortality. Maybe that turned me off. But also I feel it was unnecessarily morbid in an Asian patient. We don't have that much reserve that you should need to understand. And I think my patients have the same results with pleurectomy decortication, which has been proven over time now. So now there are multiple papers to show you that PD is actually same or as good as EBP. There's no difference. The risk and morbidity is lesser. The problem here is when the recurrence happens, it happens within the chest if you do a PD. So what constitutes a pleurectomy decortication, radical pleurectomy decortication definition is very important. How do you define it? I'll tell you with pictures later. So, and patient's functionality is usually well preserved because you're preserving everything. So this is the other school of thought where you do an extra pleural pneumonectomy. More morbid operation, I think so, more extensive and invasive disease will benefit from this kind of surgery. The surgery still has a role, don't get me wrong, but for this you need a more youngish patient with very good pre-morbids, higher mortality and morbidity with this operation, even in experienced hands. But the big advantage is if at all recurrence occurs, it occurs outside the chest because you've basically done the best you can in the chest. These are the steps in what you would call a pleural decortication. So let me get this right. You have two pleuras to remove. Remember that. It's a visceral pleura and a parietal pleura. Number two, you need to take out the diaphragm because there are many papers to prove that the nidus of the tumor or the bulk of the tumor sits in the diaphragm. So resection of the diaphragm is part of the operation. It's not an option. Three, if you find that the pericardium is involved, you will have to remove the pericardium till you see no grossly visible macroscopic tumor. So these three things must be achieved. Then you call yourself that you've done a radical pleurectomy decortication and resection for mesothelioma. It's not about taking just the one part of the pleura coming out and say, oops, it came back again. It doesn't work that way. So it is a major undertaking by itself. It's not a small operation, and you need to be trained to do this. So this is how it looks, if, if you see the thing. So you've resected the diaphragm. You can see the wall of the atrium, shaved off the SVC. Pericardium is gone. You can even see the esophagus there. And you can see we put in, this is older ones with a Gore-Tex patch. Uh, you can see the resected diaphragm and the bulk of the tumor on both sides. So it has to be like that. As I was commenting on the TNM staging, I still think it's in process in evolution. It keeps changing very fast. Please look out for the next one, I think, which is coming out by end of this year or next year from IMIG. Okay? So based on what we have now, I think these are the best choices you can get. Okay? For a stage one or a stage two, I would say you should go with PD only. You're okay. Only for stage T3 and above, I would say you can choose. Have a definition discussion with the patient about how offering a PD versus an EPP. If you think the patient is good enough for EPP and you're happy doing it, please go ahead and do it. Okay? All right? So these are the choices you need to make in discussion with the patient, telling the patient about the prognosis. So how do I do it now? So basically now all patients of mine get preoperative chemotherapy. Okay? It's cisplatin alimta, three cycles. Okay? Now, your medical oncologist will tell, oh, we'll repeat a scan after the three cycles. You say no. 
because usually you don't see any difference except that the effusion would have gone, that's all. Okay, there will be literally no change in the size of the thing. It doesn't work that way. This is not one of those things which debulks the primary tumor. So there is no difference in a pre-op scan. Maybe if you do a biological scan, you do a PET CT scan, you can find if it was originally hot, maybe the biologic activity would have come down. That's all. Okay, radiation therapy, I usually reserve it for the post-op control. I, especially to the area where I feel over the incision, I will probably give that. Okay? Otherwise, if the tum tumor recurs, I will use that. What else do I do new? So in the last recent cases, I started doing intraoperative chemotherapy. So patients already had cisplatin alimta, three cycles, okay, all right. In the operation, you complete your operation, then you put two tubes, perfusion tubes, and you do intraoperative chemotherapy, okay. The company which sells it in this part of the world is called Transmedic. If you need help, you ask them, they'll give it to you. Okay, I think it's very good. It has got decent good outcomes. Touch wood, my local recurrence rate is much better since I've started using it. It is a bit nephrotoxic, so you need to give adenylcysteine before, take all, all, all good care of that, okay? What others can I do? You can try photodynamic therapy. There are some corners in the chest which are inaccessible, literally, or you find that you don't want to go there. So those corners you can use for PDT, it works. So a typical picture, this is how it looks like. And this is after giving chemo, effusion is gone. Look what is the, my radiologist has put as notes. Residual left pleural effusion looks like empyema. This is already a histoproven mesothelioma. So don't look at what the radiologist writes, okay, all right? Now this is my specimen, this is how it looks like. So this is a tumor, if you look at the diaphragm, it is so high volume diaphragm. So basically this diaphragm weighed about more than 800 grams. So I don't think the outcomes would be very good, okay? This is one of the things before, this is an earlier case, but we learn as we go along. But my thing is, this is where the thing happens. The nidus for a mesothelioma rests in the diaphragm. So your surgery must involve diaphragmatic resection, otherwise your surgery is not good, yeah? Okay, so this is how it looks like. So you've done this, so you have a big hole there, yeah, all right? And um, so nowadays I use this one. So I use this mesh for diaphragmatic reconstruction. Okay, it's called a dual mesh. It's very strong, quite interesting. I actually have a kinesiology study after the operation to look at the movement of the diaphragm. Quite interesting that the movement of the diaphragm it remains the same and good. Why is that? Is because we don't realize that the diaphragm is actually a single muscle. We keep thinking there's a left diaphragm and a right diaphragm. No, you've actually created a hole in one part of the diaphragm and you patched it up with something. So the diaphragm moves as a single sheet, so it works that way, okay? Right, so it's a different shot of it. So sometimes you get locally invasive uh, mesothelioma, meaning it's invading into that part of the chest wall and everything. So if you're taken out the whole of the wall, and this guy was literally youngish guy, he was about 60. So we thought that I just can't live like that, so we should give him back his function so you can put it back like this using the plates. Okay, so he gets back his function. Yeah, and obviously you cover up all the nonsense you did with this nice uh, dumb patch, right? So what do you think is on the horizon? As usual, same bugbear, what I talked about in the morning, immunotherapy. Okay, so there are two trials which is going on right now as we talk, and they are recruiting, if you're willing to take part. One is immunotherapy, nivolumab as new adjuvant. Another one is ipilumab as adjuvant. So there are two trials which they are recruiting, and they are recruiting in conjunction with doing a molecular testing for BAP1 for prognostication. I think mesothelioma is an interesting conundrum in this part of the world. I think we had our industrialization late. Most importantly, I think we have the realization of this disease late. So I went and looked up, and I said, I do about, honestly, I do about five cases a year. That is what I do. 
I thought I'll be, you know, some. Then the STS wrote back to me and said, oh, you're a major center then. So I said, what constitutes a major center? So if you do three mesotheliomas a year, you are a major center. So it is that rare in this part of the world. So you should understand that when you see big numbers, don't get scared. But this is really a rare disease. And people who come to you are in pain or they need help. So you probably need to tell your medical oncologist that you are providing this kind of surgery, you want to do this kind of surgery, you are capable, and then automatically you will get into the MDT discussion. So every case of mesothelioma, you tell your medical oncologist, I don't care if you've diagnosed one, if you're treating them by chemotherapy, I'm not going to argue, but you should bring it to the MDT for discussion. And once you start seeing those scans and when you're comfortable uh, doing this, you can call us. We're willing to help you by remote or by coming. This is the way to go. I think what we have hit in this part of the world is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, industrialization came late to Southeast Asia. We should understand that. Uh, Singapore probably came a bit early. So we are already starting to see more and more. So I think an undiagnosed disease in this part of the world is mesothelioma. So you should be aware of it. Okay. Thank you very much. You can carry this as a cue card. This is the present guidelines for MCCN for treatment of mesothelioma. Okay, all right. You will find that uh, you are not exempt from surgery anywhere in this chart. Any questions for me? Where's Alan? Yes. What's the role of pathological diagnosis? It, it is quite straightforward for H and D stain and other is other IC requirements are required. And for a surgeon, how much big specimen should be sent to the pathologist for a correct diagnosis? So frequently we found that our pathologists cannot differentiate whether it is really a real mesothelioma or not because the specimen is not not adequate. Very very practical valid question how much to send for a mesothelioma. So usually there was a saying, this is not me, this is by the late sugar baker. He used to say you should send 30 grams of tissue in a mesothelioma. So one, you do a four quadrant biopsy. You take a pinch of the diaphragm, two of the lateral wall, one of the apex. This is done, four quadrant. But what, he, what you do is when you take the lateral wall, you should take from the outside till you go hit the rib all the way, full thickness. And that should give you a clue usually. Yeah. So apex, uh, the apex you mean is apex of the no. parietal pleura? Yes. The whole thickness of the parietal pleura. From the whole thickness, including up to the wall of the rib. So at the apex, uh, I feel... Not at the apex, at the lateral wall. Lateral at the wall. lateral wall. So what about the apex of the... Apex, it doesn't need to be that thick. You're going to yeah. pull out the vein or something, so don't I do see. that. Yeah, absolutely. So the lateral, diaphragm, yeah. apex, wherever, if you see wherever there's specific thickening. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you. How many of you have dealt with mesothelioma? Why do you think you're not dealing with it? I'm just asking. Is it because you're not diagnosing? Or is it because your medical oncologists are not sending you the case? Second one, you think. So why don't you now go back to them and tell them, look, it's OK. You can treat them, but at least bring it to the MDT for discussion. Because now you have options. You should tell them that. That is, that is a way to start. Yeah. And I'm sure nowadays medical oncologists are willing to listen because it is uh, no more like I can do everything. Everybody realizes that it's a team game, whatever team you are. Yeah. Just um, a comment from the. Uh, I think in the future, the, the, with the immunotherapy, things will change a lot. I, I had some experience when I was a fellow with Dr. Bueno that a patient re who received the immunotherapy from the um, positive N2, the lymph node melted down like cheese. 
So, uh, and cup, I, I've seen some of the cases like those afterwards, it, which is very promising, which is very promising what's, um, so, so that, that will change, that will be a game changer in, in the future. Yeah, definitely. I'll tell you an interesting, one of my professors of internal medicine, my professor, um, the NUS, he developed uh, mesothelioma. Don't ask how. He didn't work in shipbuilding, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so we operated on him in 2010. And uh, the disease came back in 2015. So and then by the time he was 78, and then we started him on immunotherapy as a trial for recurrence. He lived five years after that. He passed away just last October, yeah. So it was off-label use. I mean, being a physician, he was able to understand and everything. But now there are serious trials with it, even as an adjuvant. So you can probably reduce the bulk load of the disease so that you can tell your medical oncologist, hey, I've taken on most of the disease, now you can better control with your immunotherapy. That is another selling point for you guys, yeah. Did you find Dr... Alan, is he outside? Yeah, can you call him? Tell him that we are selling timers now. Okay, I think he's going to be busy. All right, any questions? For, yes. We only have one, uh, two more topics left. Um, yeah. Is everyone here wants to proceed with the last two topics, and then we are we're done with everything? No, I, I'm okay. You can ask the crowd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you guys are all right? Okay, okay then. We'll wait for Alan to come and restart his engine. All right, all right. Um, so, so Dr. Siho is now in the committee meeting, so he cannot make it here. So we will close um, the the session for now, and we will restart it. Uh, wait, wait. All right, we we restart it at three then. Okay, three. PM. Thank you.